Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ingemar Church. My name is David Streets. I'm one of the pastors at Ingemar Church, and I serve along with Greg Cox and Dennis Henley as part of the pastoral team at Ingemar. If this is the first time that you are joining us for worship, we're delighted that you have chosen today to be a part of our service. We have been praying for you to come, so the fact that you have joined us today is an answer to our prayer, so we're quite excited. We have been praying for you and prayed for you this morning before we began our time of worship. So um, we're glad that you are here, and um, I'd like to give all of you the opportunity to take time to complete a Connect card, so if you didn't have a chance to do that before our service began, you can do it um, during the service or as the service, just after the service closes. As we prepare to worship, I want to read these words from the book of Lamentations. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And now, let us worship the Lord. Amen. That's what we're doing this morning, expressing our gratitude for what Jesus has done for us, for his faithfulness. And so let's do that together. From wherever you are, you can sit, you can stand, but just sing. Sing with us and praise the Lord. for the wilderness where I learned to thirst for your presence if I'd never known that place how could I have known you were better thank you for the lonely time when I learned to live in the silence As the other voices fade I can hear you calling me Jesus And it's worth it all just to know you
and sing. You've done great things one last time. You've done great things, Jesus, your love never fails me, my soul will sing, you have done great things, you've done great things.
Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Let's pray. God, you invite us to hold the needs of all people, our sisters and brothers, as dear to us as our own. And so we think on those who are feeling the pain of injustice this day. Ask that you would comfort them. Give us, give us ears to listen and hearts of compassion. Give us eyes to see racism, racism and nationalism for what it is, sin. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world in this moment of silent prayer. And as we think on what burdens we might also bear, help us not to forget that your church is a community. Give us a heart for those who are hurting and broken. Give us eyes to see where restoration is needed and hands to accomplish your kingdom's work in the world. Don't allow us to ignore the cries of those who are oppressed. Show us the desires of your heart and make them ours as well. Teach us compassion where it's lacking and give us the resolve to love everyone, even those we don't like or with whom we disagree. Today, as we think on these things and as we think on what your love is and the love that you require of us, show us how to love those that are in our communities and our neighbors and friends and our loved ones. Hear our prayers this day, and through the ministry of your Son, free us from the grip of the tomb, that we may desire you to the fullest and proclaim your saving deeds to all the world. I humbly ask all these things in your Son's precious name. Amen. I'll invite Greg forward as he uh, takes up our offering. We've come to that time in our worship to give back and to give thanks for all that God has given to us. Share this word from the book of Malachi. It says, I, the Lord, do not change so that you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, God says. And I will return to you. And then the people respond by asking, well, how are we to return? One of the ways that we do that is in our tithes and offerings. And then it says in Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Any time in my life that I have poured out and given thanks to God, I know that it has been returned, and for that I am grateful for all the blessings in my life and for the ways in which God continues to move in our midst and in the midst of Ingemar. And so today is an opportunity for us to thank God for our lives and for the many blessings. You'll find below our feed this morning an opportunity to give electronically. I would encourage you to give generously as you have means knowing that God will continue to bless us in our offering. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for the way in which you move in our lives and in the midst of all that we do and say we honor you. We give you thanks. We return to you with our whole lives, but we also return to you in thanksgiving just a portion of that which you have already given. Bless those gifts to your service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Before I turn to our scripture passage for today, there is an announcement that I want to make. And that announcement pertains to a charge conference that will be taking place in the life of our church on Monday, June 22nd at 7 o'clock. And it will be in Fellowship Hall, which is the place where I am right now. Um, Monday, June 22nd at 7 o'clock. 
And um, the persons who are to attend that meeting are members of leadership council. Others may attend as well, but only leadership council will have the opportunity to vote. And there are two items and two items only on that agenda. One is to approve the list of new officers and committees for um, the next 12 months in the life of the church. And the second thing is to approve an IRS housing resolution um, for Pastor Cindy Blois in advance of the time in which she would need to use that. So those are the two things. Monday, June 22nd, 7 o'clock in Fellowship Hall, a charge conference. Our scripture for today comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Hear these words. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and to our further understanding of his holy word. Well, I want to begin today by asking you a question. Did you ever go to summer camp? When you were younger, what, did you ever go to camp? I went to Boy Scout camp and I also went to church camp. And then later on, as I grew a little bit older, I worked at each, not at the same time, but I had the opportunity to work at both. An essential part of the camp experience when I attended was meals in the dining hall that were followed by singing. I loved to sing back then, and I still do love to sing. At church camp, after the meal was over and the tables were cleared, someone would reach this large can that was covered with contact paper in the center of the table, and inside that can were books, song books, that they would pass out to everyone. The ones that I remember were ones that were called Jamonville Sings. They would pass them around the table, an adult, usually a pastor, would go to the piano, and we would sing two, maybe three, maybe four songs. And I just loved that. It was a formative time in my life, a formative time in my walk with Jesus. I loved singing songs of faith because they were reinforcing what was happening to me in that experience. And one of the songs that we sang back then was, They'll Know We Are Christians. Any of you remember that song? We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored and they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And the second verse said, we will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard, I love these lines, we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. I liked that song then, and I like it today. I like it for what it says. The song has been running through my mind since I began to think of this series of messages called, How Will They Know Us? This series is based on Jesus' words to his disciples in the days before he was crucified. So they are counted as among his final words to them. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our series of messages is also based on Jesus' response when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is saying love is the most important thing. These two commandments are fundamental. They are foundational to everything that Jesus teaches and all that we, are Christ we as Christians are asked to do. Everything relates back to these. You see, friends, I, I want us to be a church that is known for our love for God, 
through the obedience to what God asks of us by our worship of God, by our giving, by our desire to care for his creation, and by our desire to honor God with our actions and our behaviors and our lives. I also want us to be known as Christians because we love each other that we will love our neighbor, that we will love each other as much and in the same way as we love ourselves. And so I've divided this topic, love of neighbor, into two separate messages. First, I want us to consider those people that we would typically identify as neighbors. These would be, for the most part, people we know, people who live near us, people who live in our communities and in our housing developments, people who are our friends and our relatives and casual acquaintances, and people who we like, and people who are nice to us. You see, these people are easy to like in most instances, right? For example, I live on the lower part of Minot Road. Our house is one of six houses all in a row. Four of those five pe families that live in those houses I consider good neighbors because they're nice to me. One of them offers to loan me tools when I'm working on something, even if I don't ask. Sometimes he buys me something for Christmas. One guy rushed to help me when I slipped on the ice and fell into the road getting my mail one day. Another neighbor borrows tools from me, but also lets my grandchildren play with the bikes and the Hot Wheels that they have for their grandchildren in their garage. Another neighbor shares wisdom and advice about taking care of his lawn and taking care of his driveway, etc. But he only offers that, excuse me, if I ask because he doesn't want to be pushy. Many of you, many of you here and out there, would fall into the same category. You're helpful people. You're kind people. And so I'm nice to people who are nice to me. I'm nice to people with the expectation that they will continue to be nice to me. And in that way, I'm nurturing the relationship I have with them. I'm confident that in most cases I can call on them if and when I have a need because that's what neighbors do. I like to be treated nicely. I appreciate polite and helpful people at the places where I shop at the doctor's office, at the dentist's office, at the hospitals where I go, and even at my bank. And I love it. I love it when people are kind and gentle and pleasant. That makes me want to go back there. That makes me feel good about that place. And that's why hospitality is such a big deal to me and also such a big deal to our church. We train our people to smile to say hello, and to greet others in a pleasant way. Before COVID-19 hit, every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock in our sanctuary area, I prayed with our greeters. I gave them a pep talk, and I helped them to anticipate the people who were coming through the door, the kinds of things that they might have been facing in the week or even in the days leading up to when they came to worship. And then I would look around them, and I would say, now remember, who is the most important person today? And they would respond, the next person who comes through the door, Pastor Streets. Because they knew that's what I wanted to hear. But they also knew that they also believed that very thing. They answered correctly because they believe in hospitality. They believe in being nice to others. As a matter of fact, they were awakening and coming to church 30 minutes more before anyone else so that they could be there in place to practice hospitality. So let's take a minute to think about all the people who fall into this category of neighbor. Remember, Jesus said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So everyone, everyone falls into one of these two categories, God or neighbor. And if you are not God, then you are neighbor. There are, su there are subcategories under the neighbor designation, but they all fall under neighbor. In this classification, when you watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, how did Mr. Rogers greet you? Every single time he opened his show, he would look at you, or at least you thought he was looking right at you. He would look right into the camera, and he would smile, and he would say, hi, neighbor. When Jesus offered these two most important commandments, do you remember what he said at the end? He said, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
you know what that means? It means that every one of God's commandments and laws and every single lesson and bit advice, bit of advice and wisdom spoken by any of the prophets is based on these two commandments. If you didn't have a Bible or if you had lost or forgotten your Bible, if you could just remember these two things, these two commandments, and you could think about acting accordingly to them, then you'd be good to go. So let's consider who are our neighbors the people we know, the people we like and care about, the people who are active in our lives. I made a list. My list has about 21, na 21 categories on it. One would be spouses. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange, spouses, neighbor, but remember, you're either God or your neighbor in the designation that Jesus decides. Spouses, parents, siblings, children, aunts, uncles, cousins. Nieces, nephews, in-laws, best friends, good friends, casual friends, next-door neighbors, neighbors on your block or in your plan, bosses, employees, co-workers, teachers, students, doctors, patients, physical therapists, patients, golf instructors, students. We care about these people because they are a part of our family or they're a part of our world or maybe, maybe they're, they're a part of someone who is treating us to get better or to overcome some kind of ailment we are facing. We care about these people because it is to our benefit as well that we are nice to them and that we love them. Isn't it interesting that Jesus chose the word neighbor? Because a neighbor is someone that you call upon for help or they call you. Last weekend, my neighbor's husband and wife went away for their anniversary. And they asked, before they left, they asked if we might get their mail and pick up their paper because they were going to be gone for a few days and they had forgotten to call and cancel all of that stuff. And we agreed. That was fine. We're glad to do it. But then Monday night, they called us on the phone and said they needed us to do something else. They said, go inside our house and do something for us inside the house, we, something we had overlooked. But we didn't have a key to be able to get into their house, and so we weren't able to do that. But then yesterday, as we were working in our yards, they walked across the yard, and they said, here, we made a copy of the keys so that you would always have a copy of our key. Some neighbors exchange house keys and keep an eye on each other's property. Some help with projects like planting grass. Some loan and borrow tools. Some loan cups of sugar and borrow infant Tylenol in the middle of the night. Some neighbors collect money and send flowers when someone in the community dies. Some share tomatoes from their garden or plants from their flower beds. We are nice to our neighbors. They are nice to us. We love our neighbors and they love us. And for us, that may be the determining factor as to who we are willing to call neighbor. But that friend is what Jesus wants us to do with everyone in our lives. They are not God. Remember the two categories. They are not God. If that's true, then they are neighbor. Jesus says you shall love your neighbor. How much? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So how do we love them? How do we show our love for our neighbors? Well, first of all, we care about them. We care about them, we are nice to them, and we are kind to them. We take an interest in them, we get to know them. We become more to them than just ships passing in the night. We learn more about them. So we care about them, but we also care for them, especially if they have meet needs that we can help to meet. Maybe they need help with a project or something. Maybe we can help them to make a repair. Maybe we pick up something for them at the store. Another way we show our love is that perhaps we share information with them, especially when we have recently moved to the community. Who is your doctor? Who is your dentist? Where do you get your haircut? Who is your veterinarian? Who fixes your furnace, repairs your appliances? Who's your electrician, your plumber? Where do you shop? Where can I go if I need to buy this particular item? Who does your painting? Who replaces your roof? Neighbors network with each other. How else do we show our love for our neighbors? We root for them. 
We want what's best for them. We hope and pray for them. We celebrate successes and victories with them. We grieve with them. We go to their parties. They invite us to, we, they go, we go to their parties. They invite, we invite them to ours. We grieve with them. We give blood for them and sponsor blood drives on their behalf. We donate to causes that are important to them because they've asked us to do so. We buy popcorn and Girl Scout cookies from their children because we want to. How else do we show our love for our neighbors? Well, we never wish ill upon them or misfortune of any sort to come their way. Sometimes we may get a little jealous and an evil thought may enter our mind, right? I mean, we're not perfect. But sometimes, so sometimes we will think to ourselves, you know, sometimes I just like something not to go so perfectly for them all the time. But then we come to our senses and we reset ourselves so that we don't resort to gossip and we don't allow our thoughts to dwell there. How else do we show our love for our neighbor? We are patient with them. We know that no one's perfect and everyone needs a little extra grace now and then. Some of our friends may be EGR friends, extra grace required. Do you have any of those? Or maybe you are one of those. If our neighbors have kids, we are patient with their kids as well. No matter how much noise their kids make or how many times their ball comes into our yard. I grew up in a small town in Versailles Borough near McKeesport, and we used to play ball on the street all the time, kickball, wiffle ball, football. And sometimes the ball would go into the neighbor's yard and we would get it and then we would get back to, their, to our game. But one time the wiffle ball landed near a neighbor working in their yard and they confiscated it. They took our ball. I was speechless. They can't do that. It's, it's our ball. But they did. They did take it. And then they took it in the house. And so eventually one of us had to figure out how we were going to get it back. And we certainly weren't going to break in. So we decided that somebody needed to go over and ask for it. So the next day, I was the one that went. I knocked on the door and I asked for it back. And they gave it back. But only after we promised to never, ever hit the ball into their yard again for as long as we lived. And, of course, we agreed to do that until the next time it happened. Another thing that we do to show our neighbor our love for them is that we are always willing to forgive them. People make mistakes. Sometimes they say things that they shouldn't. Some do things without thinking things through thoroughly. Love is essential to all relationships. But I think forgiveness lubricates the gears and helps those relationships to function smoothly. Are you able to forgive others? Friends, family members, co-workers, even if they do it more than once, if they do it again and then again. Ask yourself, have you ever been forgiven? Take a minute. Have you ever been forgiven? Think of something in some way where someone has forgiven you. Because, the, you. because all of us have been forgiven. When I was the pastor at Wesley Church, we had an organist by the name of Susan Hess. She was a, uh, a, a delightful person. She had great faith, and she had had lots of experience in various kinds of churches, both positive and negative. And once she came to Wesley, she believed that she'd found the church that she'd been looking for. She felt that it was a place where she could go home. She loved our church. She loved our staff. And she was just precious, a precious member of our staff. One time during worship, she was playing the pipe organ behind me. And the tempo of the hymn was way too slow, in my opinion. I had selected that hymn. I had heard it played and sung in an up-tempo fashion many, many, many times. It was supposed to be a rousing song, an enthusiastic song, in my opinion, and Susan didn't know it. Anyway, Susan played it way too slow for my pleasure, and the tempo was killing me. 
And so I turned to her at the end of the first verse and I said, Susan, that's way too slow. Could you play it faster in front of the entire congregation? Her face turned beet red and she scowled at me and I knew I had embarrassed her. After church, she left the church building quickly so there wasn't time for us to speak to each other. The next day, she came into our office building and went back into the work area so that she could make some copies for choir rehearsal, and I went back to apologize. And I said to her, Susan, I am so sorry that I embarrassed you yesterday during worship. I will never do that again. But before I could finish, she looked up with kind eyes and she said to me, I know you are, Pastor, because I know your heart. She smiled a smile that said, I forgive you from the bottom of my heart. She knew I was sorry because she knew my heart. She knew I'd never want to hurt her because she knew my heart. And that was one of the nicest things I'd ever had anybody say to me. Friends, I believe that Jesus came to make the world a better place. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly to the full have life in all its fullness. He came that all of us might have life in all its fullness. That's what we mean when we say at Ingemar Church that we make life better because, because we help people to find Jesus and to have a better life. We believe life is better with Jesus at the center. We are called to help place people's hands on the door that leads to God. Now, part of having that better life is experiencing life in the Christian community, in the church. It includes loving others as our neighbors and being loved by others in the same way. It is experiencing the kingdom of God on earth and helping others to do the same by, by being Jesus to them, as well as by introducing them to Jesus. It was St. Francis of Assisi who said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. The culture of the Christian community is a culture that is based on love. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So now we've addressed love for God, and we've now addressed this first part of loving your neighbor. So we've just done the easy parts. Next week and the week after that, it gets a little bit harder. So get ready and be sure not to miss it. Now for our next steps, first of all, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't already, to memorize Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors, you love yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then for these steps, make a list. Make a list of all the people in your life that you would consider a neighbor. Secondly, ask yourself, how do you show love to your neighbors? Add your neighbors to your prayer list if they're not there already, and ask yourself, what else can I do to love my neighbors? Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are grateful for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your blessings that surround us in all things. We thank you for your love, and we want to be not just recipients of your love, but we want to be people who channel love to others. And so I pray that you would guide us, that you would bless us, and that you would help us to love you by being obedient to you, and that you would help us to love neighbors as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, won't you join us for our final song this morning? My Jesus, I love thee.
to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you next week.